All right, good evening, everybody, and, and welcome to this meeting of the Orange County School Board. Thank you for coming down and joining us this evening. We have some wonderful recognitions to start off our, our meeting of some wonderful community partners. But before I do, let me ask you to please stand and, and bow your head in a moment of silence, and then we will do the Pledge of Allegiance. As I mentioned, we have some terrific recommendation, uh, uh, recognitions to do tonight. Uh, this week is National Red Ribbon Week. All week long in our schools, there are activities surrounding a healthy and a drug-free community. The national campaign began in 1985, and it has touched millions of people around the world during this time. Ms. Christine Stilwell is our Area Director of Informed Families Florida. And among many programs, Ms. Stowell oversees our Red Ribbon Certified Schools Program. She joins us tonight with more on how this campaign has touched Orange County Public Schools again this year, but perhaps most importantly, how it has touched our students. So, Ms. Stowell, welcome, and we're looking forward to your comments. Thank you for coming tonight. Great. Thank you for having me. So why is Red Ribbon Week still relevant and important 30 years after the first National Red Ribbon Week? Unfortunately, roughly 74,000 Americans died last year of drug overdoses. That's more deaths from gun violence or vehicle crashes. While attention must be paid to helping those already <laughs> suffered from opioid addiction, we believe that preventing problems before they start must be a priority. Today, we're here to recognize schools that have done just that, made prevention a top priority. With funding from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration in 2005, we developed the Red Ribbon Certified Schools Program as a way to honor schools that demonstrate excellence in prevention. These schools just don't celebrate Red Ribbon Week. They are dedicated to year-round prevention and work as a team, which includes students, parents, staff, and members of the community to create a healthy environment for children. Orange County schools are very strong when it comes to drug prevention. In fact, three of the four schools in the nation that are being honored this year are right here in Orange County. They are, mm -hmm, always, we have the most, <laughs> the other schools in Chicago. They are Robinswood Middle School, Wedgeville K-8 School, and Weingart Elementary School. This is a tremendous accomplishment. Not only are these schools doing excellent prevention work, but they are dedicating time to complete a comprehensive application that was ultimately reviewed by a group of experts in the field of prevention under the guidance of the University of Central Florida. The schools were reviewed in the following four areas. Leadership commitment to a healthy school environment, use of best practices in prevention education, parent involvement, and year-round commitment to red ribbon youth substance abuse prevention activities. Our three Orlando schools will be joining over 80 Red Ribbon Certified Schools across the nation who proudly display their Red Ribbon Certified School flag. So now with Sharon Warner, a Red Ribbon Certified School mentor, we will be calling these schools up to prevent, or present them with a flag, plaque and I'll be telling you a quick snippet about something that we noticed on their application. The first school is Robinswood Middle School, and we'd like to recognize Principal Nicole Jefferson and the lead applicant, Otis Milton. <laughs> Robinswood Middle School had the highest scoring application of the past several years, so thank them for their great work in the application process. Wedgefield K-8 School, with Principal Natalie Stevens and Lead Audrey Getter. <laughs> Although Wedgeville is a relatively new school, they already have a history of red ribbon um, activities and they won the Orange County Drug Free Office Red Ribbon Celebration several years ago. And finally, Weingart Elementary School with Principal Megan Rivera and Lead Applicant Christine Mochow. <laughs> 
One thing that stood out in their application was their extraordinary number of hour, volunteer hours for their youth and adults involved in their school. Okay, thank you for having us this year. And congratulations to our schools. Well, before you all sit down, we'd love to shake your hands. And uh, Ms. Stilwell, yours in particular and your team, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. And these That's principals right. and the lead teachers, we recognize all the hard work that goes into yes. putting in these applications and making this program work. So thank you. Yes. All right, also tonight we have special guests uh, from Talk of the Town Restaurant Group and from Hello Florida Destination Management. Um, their representatives are here to do something that we absolutely love on the Orange County School Board, which is to make a check presentation to us, and more specifically to the Foundation for Orange County Public Schools. Um, Talk of the Town selected the Hello Florida Field Trip Fund as the charity of choice for the month of August. And through this fund, uh, diners were asked to uh, contribute and encouraged to round up their bills when paying their checks to contribute to the fund. And due to this contribution, low-income students have had the opportunity to attend STEM-related field trips. So for that, we thank you very, very much, because that's something that's uh, really at the top of our priority list. We are very proud to welcome and introduce Talk of the Town Executive Vice President Clark Woodsby. Vice President and Chief Operating Officer Seth Miller, Director of Sales and Special Events Ms. Amy Hernandez, Marketing Manager Brittany Oliveria, Hello Florida Senior Vice President and General Manager Vic Laxon, and Senior Account Executive Shannon Orme. Welcome. I understand you have some good news to share with us, and I would love to invite y'all. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here as far as protocol, so I'm going to take the privilege of the chair and ask all of you to come on up to the lectern and share with us this wonderful news, and thank you. Well, thank you again. Um, I am Shannon Orm with Hello Florida Destination Management. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Mr. Sublette. No, cool. um, and I, <laughs> again, I think you summed it up, but we are so privileged as an organization to partner with our partners at Talk of the Town. And if you'd like to say a few words, thank you all again. We're really thrilled to see this program just increase every yeah, year. Thank so you. thank you. Um, hi, I'm Seth Miller. I'm the CEO of Talk of the Town Restaurant Group here with an amazing team, obviously. But um, it was an important mission for us to raise money for the community. We do it every month through a Roundup campaign. Uh, we've actually started off our foundation 18 months ago. We've raised over $600,000 for the community, everything local. Um, but this was a special one. Obviously, we get to partner with champions of the community, the teachers, and encourage them to come in and support their own cause. So I think you, I don't know if you mentioned the amount, but it was over $22,000 just for the month. So, so it's a big number. So this is our second year. We plan on definitely doing it next year. I know Dr. Jenkins wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> and, um, and thank you all for your support of our restaurants. And this month is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, obviously, and we are supporting the Gina McReynolds Foundation. So it's a local organization here where 100% of the money goes to help families that are going through the process um, and helping them support those families. 
So come into the restaurants, round up. Every dollar counts, that's what we say. So thank you. Thank you. Well, before you sit down, let us let us brag on y'all a little bit more. And I know Ms. Gould, uh, don't don't sit down just yet. We want to brag on y'all. Come on, y'all look marvelous up there. So let us brag. So uh, you know, talk of the town is the restaurant group. But let me mention some of the restaurants for our audience because we do have quite a few watch us and. Some of my favorite places are on here. And this is a great promotion. It gives us a great excuse to go eat at your wonderful great. establishments. We have Charlie's Steakhouse, Fish Bones, my favorite. Yeah. Moonfish, <laughs> another one of my favorites. Texas Cattle Company. My favorite. Vito's Chop House and Johnny's Hideaway. Those are the restaurants that make up Talk of the Town. So thank you for this wonderful initiative. And I know Ms. Gould wanted to say a few words as well. Ms. Gould? I also want to thank you and, and um, really for stepping up into this initiative. You know, this Sharon and, and many of you are parents and have kids in schools and you know the importance of this. But also you really wrapped around our teachers with special pricing for them, which made it not only affordable but fun to go out and eat um, at, the, at the restaurants and be able to give back. So it really was a wonderful, wonderful way to um, to support all the programming that we want to be able to bring to our students. So thank you very much. And and uh, my favorite is Moonfish. So just to get my favorite in there too. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. Well, we'd love to shake your hands as well. So thank you again. Okay, thank you. And I would be remiss if I didn't recognize Ms. Pedraza, who does a wonderful job on these initiatives for us. So Debbie, thank you for all that you do. All right. What? Yes, Ms. Cadle. Can, can we give a shout out for um, Ms. Pedraza's team and everyone who worked so hard on right. the golf tournament? That's right. What did you all end up raising? Wow. Yeah, 137,000 in sponsorships, and they're still tallying the results from the day. You could buy raffle tickets, you could do auction. Um, am I forgetting anything? Oh, yeah, the ball launcher, and our own Mr. Howitt won the ball launcher. Um, you could buy mulligans, right? Or no? The long drive professionals. So um, a lot, there were, I, Mr. Pachenko and I are just very good friends now because we were in, on, we were on 18 thanking all the sponsors for the day and people came and talked about what a great event it was, how much fun they had. And if I can tell you one thing, they really liked playing golf in October <laughs> instead of September. So it was, it was still hot, but it wasn't as hot as September was. So hats off to your whole team who were phenomenal that day. Thank you again, Debbie, for everything you do for us. All right, tonight we recognize three, yes, three national awards for our Human Resources Department. The awards are all from the American Association of School Personnel Administrators, and our team was recognized at their annual conference in Minneapolis, Minnesota earlier this month. James Preusser, Senior Executive Director of Human Resources, and his team are here for this recognition. Mr. Preusser, please stand and let us recognize you. Have your entire team stand. Let us recognize all y'all. I love the shirts. Let me ask you all to stay standing while I brag on you a little bit. Well, first, the Human Resources Department was scheduled for the ASPA William L. was selected, excuse me, for the ASPA William L. Hunter 
Point of Light Award, recognizing school districts that implement innovative and comprehensive programs primarily focused on strategies to increase the number of teachers of color within their ranks. I think that's a wonderful initiative. Let's give it up for that first award. Congratulations. And raise your hand if you led that initiative on your team. Who, who on your team led that, led that initiative, Mr. Preusser? Any Anybody in particular? Okay. Well, we'll recognize them as Pistachia. Second, HR has been honored with the Digital Branding Award for leveraging digital technology to communicate and gather information from current and prospective employees. And last, but certainly not least, Ms. Bonnie Tafuli. Ms. Where's Bonnie at? Raise your hand, Bonnie. Bonnie is the Assistant Director of Innovation for Recruitment and Retention, and she earned the HR Specialist Support Staff Award. Her contributions significantly impacted the efficiency of the HR department, and she distinguished herself as a leader and valuable member of our high-performing and dedicated team. So Mr. Purser and Bonnie and your entire HR team, thank you so much for making us look so good on the national stage. Um, we're so very, very proud of all of y'all, and we know it came through a lot of hard work. So thank you for the hard work on behalf of our district. And we're not going to let you escape unscathed. The board would like to shake your hands as well. So come on down. It's like the price is right. Come on down. All right, we have um, one newly appointed administrator to recognize tonight before we get into our regular agenda, Dr. Jenkins. Thank you, Chairman. Only one, that is Brad Rosa, who was interim AP at Waterford Elementary. He is the new assistant principal at Lakemont Elementary. Thank you, I'd like to take the time to thank Chairman Sublette and the board, Dr. Jenkins and her staff. Um, look forward to serving the community at Lakemont elementary school, uh, families and children there as well. Uh, I'd like to take the time to thank my wife, son Braden, uh, my mother Joan, my father Barry, my stepmother Sue, um, Little River family who has always been there to support me as well, uh, Miss Peterson for the last couple weeks of mentorship as well, um, and I look forward to this next chapter of my life, Miss Cato in serving District 1. Thank you. Miss Cato. Brad, you have some big shoes to fill, <laughs> but I know you're going to do wonderfully at Lakemont, and it is 
a great school with great community support and I know they'll be there to help you and I know that Principal Fox will be there for you too so welcome to the neighborhood and like I said my days here are numbered but I drive by the school probably four to six times a day so I'll be popping in from time to time it's just that neighborhood volunteer that you don't know what to do with Sarah, I have a speaker card. So I just found it. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Mr. Rosa, uh, congratulations. Um, forgive me, but is this your son here? Uh, what's his name? Braden. Braden, you have been wonderfully well behaved. Stand up and take a bow for us. Say hi to everybody. This is Braden, everybody. Congratulations. For a little one, this is like watching paint dry. So I always like to recognize them. So, Mr. Rosa, congratulations. I always like to share with every newly appointed administrator that your appointment really signifies one very simple word to this board and administration, and that word is trust. It means that we trust your leadership abilities. It means that we trust your judgment. But perhaps most importantly, it means that we trust you with the future of our community, our children. And for that, your loved ones and your family and your colleagues should be extremely proud of you as we are extremely proud of you. So congratulations, Mr. Rosa. And now parents hate me for this, Mr. Rosa, but it's ice cream time. So take that wonderful kid and go out and, congrat and, and celebrate. Congratulations again. We'll pause here for a moment. I asked him out front if he was good at cooking hamburgers and hot dogs because Mr. Fox cooks for his staff oh. on special days. So his son assured me that his dad cooks really good hamburgers and hot dogs. All right. uh, now on our uh, strategic uh, plan update, um, let me turn it over to, to Dr. Jenkins. Thank you, Chairman, uh, members of the board. This is a required annual update uh, per the Department of Education and new statute for you to receive a public briefing. If you'll recall, we keep some of the information at a high level. Other information is still considered confidential per statute. Tonight, we have our school safety specialist, also known as Chief Brian Holmes, to bring you the required annual update. Chief Holmes. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. Good evening, Chairman Sublet, uh, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Jenkins. Uh, as she just said, um, this is the first of what will be an annual or yearly update uh, required by the state. Uh, it was passed as part of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Public Safety Act, which you'll hear me say quite a bit tonight. Um, and uh, uh, it's a good thing, and we're glad this is happening uh, for the state of Florida and for all of school safety. I'll go over briefly our agenda. Uh, I'm going to do some background on our safety and security programming. Um, we'll talk a little bit about this role of the school safety specialists and the responsibilities. Uh, I'll talk about our areas of prioritization of our safety and security program. I'll talk again about the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Public Safety Act and some of the requirements that were required, uh, some of the requirements. And last but not least, I'll do a status and an overview of some findings uh, based on our Florida Safe School Assessment Tool. So into the background. First of all, the tragic events that took place at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School obviously puts school safety, security, emergency preparedness, and mental health programming on everyone's radar. Uh, that said, OCPS didn't just start this. Uh, you, the board, have been hard at work um, approving, funding, and allowing us to move forward with what I would cons uh, consider a very robust and rigorous program for safety, security, uh, and mental health, and emergency preparedness. Back in 2014, uh, the board um, employed a school safety and security consulting firm by the name of Safe Havens International, let me catch up on my slides, to conduct a district-wide safety, security, 
and emergency management assessment of the school district. It came in and really took a hard look at what we're doing here for security programming. Uh, they made recommendations of like, a, and this was a very extensive report. I don't know how many pages it was, but it was very thick. Uh, it had a lot of recommendations. It was almost a cafeteria plan, so to speak, of what you can do better, how you compare to other districts, um, very thorough. It also went out and conducted what we call an SRVA, or a security risk and vulnerability assessment of every Orange County public school. They literally went in to every school and looked at it and gave us a report, a very thorough report of not only what they found, but what we should do differently. Very, very thorough. Uh, in 2018, let's fast forward four years, uh, we had the event at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. The board was on top of it. Uh, they again uh, enlisted Safe Haven uh, in International to come back to perform an updated safety and security and emergency management assessment of school. Now this is before they passed uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and they turned that around very quick. I think once it got to the legislature, I think it was in, in the legislature for three weeks and out. That's how quick, but the board was on top of it and brought safe havens back. And what did they do? We had a sampling of schools because we already had a very thorough look at the schools previously. We had a sampling, but they also took a look at what we had done in the last four years. Had we been sitting on our hands or had we been putting our back to the plow? And um, I'm proud to say uh, we've been, we were working. Let's talk a little bit about the school safety specialist's role and responsibility. And I just tried to, to distill it down to a few bullets. You've read the legislation before. It's got a lot of parts and pieces to it. But the superintendent for the school district is required to designate a school safety specialist, one. Two, the school, space, uh, the school safety specialist is to supervise and oversee school safety and security personnel policies and procedures for the district. Um, I'm also required to earn a school safety specialist training certificate within one year of my appointment. Uh, the Department of Education better get on the stick because uh, I was appointed as of July 1st, which was when we were required to appoint, and they still don't have the training. So we're hoping, yes, we had a meeting and they said, uh, the Office of Safe School said, sometime after the first of the year, but you know, we'll let you know. So we're still waiting. Last but not least, and again, I'm trying to distill this down to the idea, uh, the position is to focus on providing a safe educational environment for all students within the school district. So let's talk about our areas of prioritization and how we break it down here at OCPS. We really break it down in four areas. The district police uh, is really in charge of police and security programming. Safety and emergency management, overseas emergency preparedness, I'll talk in detail about these. The facility asset protection team uh, is uh, responsible for f physical security improvements and uh, student services overseas, the mental health piece. So uh, one that I've been involved in from its beginning uh, was establishing the district police. Uh, just about a year after Safe Havens came in and did their assessment, we stood up OCPS District Police in August of 2015. Uh, what do we do? We, pro we uh, provide law enforcement service to the district. We act as a liaison with law enforcement partners, which is a really critical piece of what we do. And we also manage our district security functions. I have 16 sworn law enforcement positions. Uh, we have converted what was a security control center to a uh, police communication center, which is, was a feat in and of itself, something I'm uh, really proud of that particular team. I have a supervisor and eight computer, uh, communication specialists that work 24-7, 365. We have an information and analysis unit, which has five intel analyst positions. These are police certified intelligence analysts. They, they uh, Work closely with the local agency intel analysts, um, back and forth, providing information, things we need to know, things they need to know. They're a liaison with those, with those agencies, and it's very, very beneficial to have those, uh, those boots uh, uh, helping us out. 
We also have an electronic security systems unit that uh, works on and with all of our electronic security systems and also have 16 security officers who work for us, again, 24-7, 365. If there's something that happens in school, either during hours or after hours, they're responding out there to represent the district at all hours of the day and night. So what else does the district police do to make for a safer school environment? Well, we, we manage the random safety screening program. You may have taught, uh, may have seen the superintendent waving the electronic uh, uh, security, uh, the electronic metal detection wand at our uh, just prior to the school year um, press conference. Um, we do them in several ways. I don't want to go into a great bit of detail on this, but we do a full scale uh, screenings where it's very similar to, to a TSA. You go to the airport and you're going through the lines. Uh, you're going to get some sort of electronic screening. They're going to take a look in your bag and they're going to make sure you're not carrying anything that you shouldn't uh, have in your bag or have anything on you going into the school. We do small scale screenings, which is very similar, but it could be of a, a classroom. It could be a, gymna a gym class. It might be a bus. And we'll do randomly selected buses. When they come in, they come off the bus, the kids get screened. The message is that at OCPS, anytime, any place, any day, any classroom, at any school, you could be screened for a weapon. All right, we have a, we have a search policy that everybody has to sign off before the school year, and it allows us for to do this, and this is just one way we can send that message, don't bring a weapon to one of our schools. We also manage the visitor and access management system, uh, which includes an enterprise, visit, uh, enterprise visitor management system. That system keeps us, uh, we, we know who's coming into our school. If somebody happens to be a sex offender, it's gonna come up on the screen that they're a sex offender. Right there, and so we know we're dealing with. And we do have family members and parents of students who have been convicted of a sex offense. Uh, they can come to our school and attend functions, but they have to be monitored by school administration. But we're gonna know. You come in, you present your ID, we scan you, we're gonna know who you are, you're gonna be in the system, and if you're a sex offender, we're gonna have that. Very important to keep in, for us keeping a safe school. We also have access control and badging system, some of this, you swipe, and we manage the perimeter fencing to make sure we got fences around the perimeter of our campuses, and we focus on a single point of entry. Let's talk about safety and emergency management and that team. Um, I must say uh, they do a fantastic job with their emergency plans and planning. Uh, they have uh, a comprehensive emergency management plan for all hazards that the district may face. And the average uh, person would n not really realize how many hazards that we may have to face here at the school district and have to manage. And they, and they, they put it all down in a policy and procedure and how that's to be done. Really well done. And it was a very, very uh, heavy lift to make that happen. They also put together last year a uh, new emergency procedures manual with uh, uh, um, uh, that is uh, a really first class. We have, uh, they, pro they provide classroom materials and they uh, monitor our weather and stay on top of all these lightning strikes and everything that's going on and uh, making sure the schools are getting locked down. They have information um, so that they're uh, not releasing the kids out into dangerous weather situations. They also manage our training drills and exercise programs. They've put together seven emergency preparedness training courses, which are uh, really well done. Uh, they manage our active assailant drill program, and uh, they've also been involved in conducting both district-wide and school-based tabletop exercises, where we bring the school together, they have their CERT team, which is our uh, emergency response team, and they work through problems things that might happen at the school that's an emergency, and they work the problem right there. You've got to exercise or you're not going to be able to do it when it happens, and that's something that emergency uh, management and emergency preparedness uh, forces them to do, willingly, of course, I'm sure, at the school level, but uh, it's very effective 
and they're doing a great job of that. We also have facilities asset protection team that uh, handles all of our physical uh, security improvements, which include a VIX. We call them VIX, but video intercoms. When you go to enter a school, you push the button, you can talk to the person. That's the gatekeeper right there on the video intercom. They can see you on the screen, and they can talk to you. We have proximity card readers again, back to the badges. We have, again, the per perimeter fencing program. They manage signage school design guidelines, and these are really important because this is where we can plug in the latest up-to-date uh, best practices into our schools right up front. They call it SEPTED, Crime Prevention by Environmental Design. What can we prevent before it actually happens just through the design of our school? Really, really important, and they do a great job of managing that program. And they have other confidential surveillance strategies that I'm not gonna talk about here today, but uh, they are involved in that along with the district police. And last, and what I would consider prob probably the most important is the district's commitment to mental health of our children. This is truly, in my opinion, a prevention and early intervention strategy that's been long overlooked for years, and I am so glad that Marjorie Stoneman Douglas came in and threw some funding on top of this. All right, and I'm gonna talk about that a little more in detail, but. Let me just tell you what they do. They provide a continuum of services to meet the social, emotional, and mental health needs of all students at OCPS. Uh, they have, and this is part of what they've been doing to update and upgrade since Marjorie Stoneman, but they've in increased our community partnerships to support students with mental health needs. They work in collaboration with uh, my office of school safety specialists to collect data on youth mental health first aid training and mental health follow-up, as well as uh, they provide mental health staff. And so far this year, since the beginning of the year, remember we got new funding, and these ladies up here in front, uh, Mary, Mary and Anna are smiling because they got a big check. Very similar to that big check they were holding up here, they got a big check. And they're hiring, they've, they've hired six school psychologists, They've hired three school social workers with two additional in the onboarding process right now. Uh, they've hired 11 district mental health counselors with six more in the queue to be hired. So we're really pleased they're rolling this program out um, and doing, uh, again, a fantastic job of making all that happen. That helps me sleep well at night, knowing that we've got prevention and early intervention involved in this program, particularly in this area. So let's talk about a little bit more about what we've been doing to comply with Marjorie Stoneman Douglas because it's a big bill. I don't have everything in here, but I'm trying to hit the highlights again, distill it down to what we really think is important. Uh, we've assigned an SRO, a school resource officer, to each of our schools. We've established school-based threat assessment teams. The principal oversees that program, brings in the mental health counselor, brings in the SRO, other school staff, and they work the problem again once a month. They're required to meet, but if they have a problem student threatening to hurt themselves and or others, they work that. And we don't let that stuff just go away and sit on the shelf. Uh, they're all involved in that team um, every month, and uh, they stay on top of these issues. Uh, uh, for us, we're gonna continue uh, with our Student Crime Watch program. We already had this up and running. Again, I go back to, we've been working on this for a while, so this, some of this stuff was already up and uh, in, in process or uh, operational. Uh, we're gonna continue with our relationship uh, with the Speak Out hotline, 1-800-423-TIPS. Please, if you don't have the P3 Campus app, moms, dads, students, you should have this on your phone. I have it on mine, all right? And it's a great way for your kids to make an anonymous report if something's going on. You see something, say something. Make that anonymous report. If you don't, you feel uncomfortable, make it on the kids. They're all over their phones all the time. It's an easy way for them to do it. That information is filtered right back to the district police, right to our communications center, 24-7, 365. We're not going to let that drop. Someone's going to be woke up. It's gonna be investigated. We're gonna reach out to our law enforcement partners. So that's really, really important. We're also participating in Fortify Florida. You may have seen uh, 
Attorney General Bondi rolled that out here recently at the International Association of Chiefs of Police Conference they had here in Orlando. Uh, she rolled that out. Now it's new. We are participating. If we get a tip through Fortify Florida, we'll get the tip. It'll come back to me. I've already got one. Back to me, it was a test type situation. Uh, I won't go into details on it, but I called the guy back and uh, it was a test. I'll just leave it at that. And last in this bullet, uh, we've got, uh, we also conduct our active assailant and uh, we'll continue to conduct our active assailant in hostage situation drills. That program is up and running right now. We're also required to complete what's called a Florida Safe School Assessment Tool every year. Um, the Florida Safe, as part of the Florida Safe Assessment Tool, they have created their own school security risk assessment program. It's a mouthful. But with that said, we're required, all schools are required to complete that annually. We had to have ours done by July 1st. We got them in on time. Again, no small tasks. We have a lot of schools. That included the charter schools. They had to complete theirs as well. And uh, that goes up under a dashboard where I can go in and take a look at the aggregate data, the, you know, the macro and the micro of what's going on in a school based on what the principal uh, has entered into it. They work closely with their SROs. They work closely with my police commanders to get this information into the tool. We had to get that in uh, for each one of these schools if we're going to uh, be able to apply for the school hardening grant. I'll talk about in a minute. Some of the areas reviewed, and I'm getting behind on this, uh, is uh, our emergency uh, and crisis preparedness for the district, obviously security, uh, school police staffing, uh, and the operational practices. So those are the things that are going in to that particular uh, SRVA and it's, uh, it's important. It's great that uh, Department of Education is really stepping up and providing some tools. This is work we were already doing. We had our own SRVAs. We had this in advance uh, that we had worked through Safe Havens International to do, but now, uh, needless to say, we're complying with what the state's requiring. We also didn't want to have to double up on the work. So here's something I think everybody in the district should be proud of. This is an extract that came out of the report that was given to us by Safe Havens International on the update. And it said, in our opinion, OCPS has aggressively, proactively, and professionally confronted the topic of school safety in a manner that stands out to our analysts as among the most impressive efforts of this type we have seen during our assessment projects for more than 6,000 750 K-12 schools. So I just want to say hats off to the board, hats off to our team. Uh, Senior Director Doug Tripp was involved in this from the very beginning and has done a great job uh, keeping that relationship going and making this all move forward. Um, we're very, very proud of where we're at right now. I'm not saying everything's perfect. And if there's a parent out there that has a safety or security concern, Please don't get up here to the microphone and blast it out the world. Please don't go on Facebook and start saying how concerned you are about what's going on. I need to know. We need to know. You can put it through the app, the P3 Campus app, if you have a concern. If you want to be anonymous, okay? Bring it to our attention. Let us address it. Or at least uh, we can talk about it. Give us a call here at the district. So let's talk about some findings and recommendations and we'll be wrapping it up here. Um, uh, my findings based on your school safety specialists is that OCPS is in the process of meeting or exceeding the required requirements set forth by the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Public Safety Act. Uh, we're also on track to meet all of our required deadlines. It's, it's, it's tough, but we're keeping up with it. Some of the programs are in, in the beginning stages, but we're confident we're going to get it done. We've got a great team, and um, I'm, I'm confident we're going to make our deadlines on this. Some of the recommendations I've given are please continue with our district-wide active assailant and hostage situation training with our law enforcement. It's so important that that piece right there be done and done well and be effective. It's got to be effective. The kids can't be treating these type of drills like it's just another drill. 
All right? We need to, we need to train like we're going to do it in the real world. There's no time to waste. None. We also, uh, I suggest we continue enhancing our school electronic and physical security infrastructure. Some of this money has already been provided for us and we're continuing to approve our camera systems and all of our access management systems, bringing it all down to one camera system, et cetera. I can go on and on about it. And we have that funding and it's already been approved by the board. Um, we'll come back to you if we need some more. I promise. That said, um, we are interested in the hardening grant. We want to pursue that educational facilities security grant for hardening of our schools. There are areas, everything can be approved, and we have some very uh, aged um, classic schools. And they're wonderful, but they don't have the same types of things that are built in on the front end on all the new state-of-the-art schools. All right, so we need to go back, look very hard at those, and even some of the newer schools need some hardening right up front. So uh, I'm not gonna go into details on what that is, but uh, we are gonna pursue that grant, and hopefully um, we're gonna qualify for it. So with that said, um, that, that, that's your update, and uh, I'll stand by for any questions if anyone has any. All right, thank you, Chief Holmes, for that excellent summary. Uh, Mrs. Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to Dr. Jenkins and to uh, the chairman and, and the school board, I really want to thank you, Chief Holmes, for the professionalism of your officers and your security team. Um, all of us have been out in our schools and our communities, and we've been having lots and lots of meetings and events that we as school board members have attended. And I really believe that there have not been one board member up here probably could say that we were not um, protected in some form or manner with either both the security team on campus or an OCPS officer or working together as a team with other law enforcement officers. I know every one of my meeting, it has either been both our security team and OCP police officers and the sheriff department, if it is the unincorporated orange, and the OPDs of the 13 municipalities. So I do want to say, I know it started off pretty rough. We're trying to get the law enforcement to understand and accept Dr. Jenkins' dream of having this OCPS police team and people crossing the line. But in all of the meetings that I've attended, and I'm sure the other board members would make comments in reference to it, they're very impressed with the respect that you are showing and working together. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I do understand now that all 13 municipalities have come on board, and you, you may address that later, or any, you could just address that any time you want to with us. But I mean, I really began to see all of the law enforcement agency working together, and that means a lot. Um, it did come up in one of the meetings last night with Magnolia, um, with the Magnolia, Cherokee, and Gateway combination of the Behavior Learning Center that will be out off of Hawassi. Um, they were concerned, you know, about some of the issues, but I think that your team have put that to rest. But I don't want to um, make it lenient um, that they may not have, a, you know, a little more security or not more, but uh, I understand, I believe, that they will get the double security based on the security person coming from, and that would be operations with Dr. Jenkins, coming from Cherokee and Gateway. So they may have reinforcement, you know, of some type if they, if they need it. And I want to commend you all for even working on that, even if it's not settled, because it's not going to be until about 2020 when they, you know, really get their foot off the ground. So I appreciate that endeavor. Um, the hostage situation, training i I'm, I'm so glad that that's coming up because as we go throughout our community we are hearing a lot about it and the faculty and staff and parents being informed even at the parent academy um even doing a hostage situation at the parent academy for parents in case anything happened there because they know 
that that is becoming a very large gathering place and what a place you know to catch somebody off guard but I know that we are always reinforced out there but I didn't want us to take for granted um, that the hostage situation could be a training that can be also given to parents while they are at the academy or any other event that we are having with children that we all are trained to protect ourselves. Um, I congratulate you and Dr. Jenkins and the entire staff, the security team and the police force for exceeding the the regulations set forth and meeting the regulations and getting those reports in. I was called to task um, about a week or two ago and I had to call Dr. Jenkins to get Scott Howard to write up a summary for me and uh, he must have gotten your report because I think I did it verbatim almost everything that you had there it was just a blessing because the audience um, came from all over the state and there were state representatives and senators and um, police um, officers and then there were the the Republican and the Democratic Party also there and people from the DEO and our that report was very impressive um, that was sent to me by Scott Howard and I wanted to thank Dr. Jenkins because I was put on the spot to come up and handle exactly what you had to say what is the situation of Orange County Public School and we had not had this meeting but we had previous meetings so I really want to say to the superintendent and the chairman for the executive sessions and thank you for having us informed I do want you to know that it did come up where people want to know the secrets of what's what and and I did that came up with the sheriff department and how we are not disclosing, and I heard you really press that we do not give out all of the details as to protecting our children and our, and our facilities. So I do want to thank you for it, and I really want to thank Dr. Jenkins because that I was really put on the spot. I think somebody, one of the elected officials, a state representative did not show up, and the state called and asked me would I speak in behalf of the, um, the, the the Marjorie Stillman, uh, Stillman Act, so that was kind of rough. But I thank Scott Howard for being efficient on that day and sending a very condensed report to me that I was able to share with the public um, from all over the state. So Dr. Jenkins, thank you, and Mr. Chairman, for having us in executive session. I'm learning a lot about the safe harbor and they were very impressed with the safe harbor report that I was able to give them a portion of that port report and distribute the findings there. So again, I wanna say thank you and we appreciate all the effort and what you're doing for us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Gordon. Um, Ms. Cato. Chief Holmes, I wanna thank you for all you've done to make sure that our children are safe. And, you know, we've been sitting here <clears throat> talking about safety for many years. And I think the fact that Safe Havens came back and said that we really have been proactive. And I know sometimes last spring when parents were upset, a lot of times I would hear from parents who have younger children that, you know, maybe the oldest they were were third grade, and sometimes you have to reflect of what did it used to be like, you know, before you had to bring your driver's license in, before you had to sign into the um, volunteer management system. There, our schools are so much safer than they were five years ago, seven years ago, 10 years ago. We're not perfect but we're working really, really hard. And one of the things I've been the proudest of of this board was when we did our strategic plan before there was anything else going on, we said we wanted a safe work environment. We said we wanted safe construction sites. We wanted our teachers to feel safe. We wanted our children to feel safe. And we wanted our community to feel safe. And I think as a board, we have not lost the importance of that. And we have worked really, really hard. So everyone who has had a hand in it, 
all the principals, all the teachers who make the classroom safe for our children each and every day. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you, Ms. Cato. Ms. Cobert. Thank you, Chair. Chief Holmes, I do want to commend you for the extraordinary work and the thorough work that you've done in, in keeping our children safe. Last week, I watched a video, it was not here in Orange County, but it was of a fourth grade class doing an active assailant training drill. And I am not going to lie, I burst into tears. And I, in watching what those children have to be prepared for. School did an outstanding job in making sure the children knew this is a drill, we're we are pretending, we are preparing. But just the fact that our children have to be prepared for something like that in this day and age is, is extraordinary and it's difficult. However, we live in an extraordinary time. I mean, a couple generations ago, you hid under, under your desk in preparation for a thermonuclear war. Mm -hmm. Now, they're taking the desks and they're barricading the doors and hiding out of sight. But I would urge um, anyone on our district staff um, and board members and future board members to watch one or participate in one, be an observer so that we are all acutely aware of what our children need to pre be prepared for and what our teachers need to be prepared for because that certainly wasn't in their job description when they were going to college and, and going to teaching school. So thank you again for the thorough work, the good work of keeping our children safe. And I just would encourage everyone to participate and really understand what our schools and our classrooms are trying to be prepared for. It'll help us all be better prepared. Thank you. Board members, great points. Um, Chief Holmes, thank you for, for this report. Um, I do want to say that, um, first and foremost, I want to thank the taxpayers of Orange County because so much of what we do is because we have the half cent sales tax. Uh, I think the thing that we have been blessed with in this community is a community of citizens that values public education and um, I'm sure that when they voted for that sales tax uh, if they were like me it was for the simple reason of, of um, uh, renovating our schools but uh, I want everybody who may be watching this to realize that that money has also allowed us to harden our facilities build more secure facilities uh, it's just a dramatic difference between walking into a school that was built in the last 10 years versus the old open walkway open campus designs that that we went to school in and none of that would be pa possible without taxpayer largesse so thank you taxpayers of orange county um, i also want to say that and i say this all the time uh, when i'm out in the public uh, that you know I, i'm a, a father of two public school children myself and I think I can genuinely say that outside of my home I feel safer when my kids are in school than perhaps anywhere else than they are during, during, during the day. I certainly feel safer while they're in school than I do when they're on the roads, especially on a Friday or Saturday night my kids are high schoolers. I feel safer than when they are in a mall or a movie theater. But I'm also aware of the fact that we are one deranged or mentally ill individual away from a similar tragedy and I think every community in America has to be aware of that fact. Um, the last thing I'll say is I want to thank Dr. Jenkins and, and her team uh, and, and, and this board because one of the things that's lost so often in these reports is we started that um, um, renewal of our safe havens review before the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas tragedy had occurred and really ever since the Sandy Hook tragedy uh, this district has had student safety and security at the forefront of our mind. It's what has led to the creation of your department. Uh, it is what has led to the random weapon screenings, the hardening of our facilities, the social media monitoring, um, the, the ability for parents and students to see something and say something, which is something that we all repeat over and over and over again. Um, and because it's so important that we hear of threats before um, something tragic happens. So thank you for this report. Uh, I do want to emphasize um, we can never do enough, but we're doing all that we humanly can with the resources at our disposal. And, and we'd just like to ask everybody in the public, because people do watch these telecasts, to please be vigilant. Let us know if you see something. 
uh, let us know if you're aware of a threat. Um, we take them very seriously. We had a little bit of a sidebar conference tonight on a threat that was brought to our attention by a citizen in the community that, frankly, um, uh, two of the board members up here, myself and the board member for that school, weren't aware of previously. So um, uh, it, it does work. So keep us informed, and we appreciate all you do, Chief. And thank you, Dr. Jenkins. All right, board members, anything else before we move off this topic? All right. Sad that we have to talk about these things nowadays, but thank you. All right, we are now board members on our regular agenda. Um, let me um, make a preliminary announcement. Anybody who would like to address any item on our agenda can do so by uh, filling out a yellow speaker card. A speaker card looks like this. You can get a yellow speaker card from, I believe it's Ms. McGill down there tonight. Ms. McGill up at the far left-hand side of the dais. And when that agenda item comes up, uh, I will call on you and recognize you to speak on that topic. At that time, you will have three minutes to address the board, and we will ask you to start with your name and your address for the record. Uh, we do not have any changes to our agenda tonight, so um, we do not need to um, uh, in, entertain a motion to adopt the agenda, So, because we're set. Um, we do have a public hearing. Um, I'm going to ask for the indulgence of the board on something. Before we go to the public hearing, I'm going to ask the board to let me take up a consent agenda item first. Uh, agenda item 4.02, because we have some ladies who have been waiting very patiently. I almost did this before the strategic plan update, um, and I don't want you to think, and I'm not going to make you sit through a rezoning before we go to this, because I know you have places to be and things to do, and you're, you're doing a service to us. So. Um, let me uh, let me recognize that agenda item 4.02 board members uh, is um, uh, uh, approval uh, of our designation of November 2018 as a Florida Family Engagement and Education Month. And uh, one thing that we know, in fact, it's part of our agenda, is we know that research shows that students with engaged parents and families are more likely, more likely to earn higher grades and test scores, enroll in higher level programs, be promoted, pass their classes and earn credits, attend school regularly, have better social skills, show improved behavior, adapt well to school, and graduate and go on to post-secondary education. So I've got a couple speakers tonight um, that I can't wait to recognize on this, but before I do, uh, ladies, I uh, hope you'll indulge me. I'd, I've asked Ms. Cobra to read our proclamation because this is important allowed, and then I'm going to invite uh, Ms. Ratter and Ms. Smith up to the podium and anybody else they'd like to bring with them. Did I say it right? We were just saying or. Or. Either, either or. Okay, I was hoping we'd get both of you all, but either or. Um, and let me turn it over to you, Ms. Cobra, to read the proclamation. Proudly. Orange County Public Schools Proclamation, Florida Family Engagement in Education Month. Whereas parent and family engagement in a child's learning is critical to student success from preschool through college and sets the foundation for preparing Florida students to be lifelong learners and meaningful contributors to society. And whereas creating an environment where learning takes place not just in a classroom, but as a central part of family life, requires that parents and families play an active role in their children's education. And whereas the role of parents and families in creating a successful preschool through college system for Florida's children is very important. And whereas Florida and Orange County Public Schools education leaders have developed resources for parents and families looking to engage more fully in their children's education and to strengthen the connections between home and schools. And whereas Florida Department of Education and Orange County Public Schools education leaders are available to support parents, families, and educators in establishing effective home-school collaborations so that parents and families can be actively engaged in the academic achievement and development of students. And whereas it is appropriate to recognize the critical contributions made by parents and families who foster a love for learning in their children, and by educators who acknowledge the importance of parent and family engagement as an integral part of the mission of Orange County Public Schools, now, therefore, be it resolved that Orange County Public Schools does hereby proclaim the month of November as Florida Family Engagement and Education Month and encourages parents, families, 
teachers, administrative staff, support personnel, and students to participate in activities with their families and families across the state of Florida in recognition of Florida Family Engagement and Education Month. Thank you, Vice Chair Cobert. So now, Ms. Raptor or Ms. Smith, and it just occurred to me as she's reading that, I hope I didn't blow your comments by reading the proclamation. <laughs> no, no, no. In fact, <laughs> thank you for coming. Filled tonight. out the yellow card because that's what Pam Carson and Irma Melinda told us to do. And then I'm like, oh, maybe we shouldn't have done that. Uh, but no, we thank you very much for your indulgence in moving us up on the agenda. And um, Chairman and board members and Superintendent Jenkins, uh, we're so grateful for the support that we get from Orange County Public Schools. And um, we love to effectuate change. We don't want it to just be in name only, it's week of the family, but to really help families throughout the year. And one of the ways is having, um, we've started making our theme always be applied to the student themselves. So no matter what their life situation's like, and as a prosecutor, I saw horrible stuff, but just in themselves, how do they effectuate change in the world around them and hopefully in their future as a parent? And um, so this year's theme was practice kindness. And so um, we had for, so we moved it, like we said before, to the spring. And so we had um, 256 entrants in the essay contest. And we had a mayor's contest. They won a mayor's trophy. And we're getting a big, like, Stanley Cup type thing to get. And Acceleration Academy East High School is winning it this year. They had 91 entrants. So that was super good. And then um, there were only nine more than Windermere Prep. So OCPS needs to watch it because <laughs> the private schools are coming up. And then Sunridge Middle School was next with 27. So, uh, so big differences in the, in the numbers. So uh, we have that, and then and I'd like to read a quote from one of them. This is from um, Chloe Joyce, who, who's a fifth grader at Stone Lakes Elementary School. She says, to wrap it up, I can practice kindness with my family using my words and actions with my family. When I do this, it spills into my interactions with other people. I do group activities, group work, and I talk to other people practicing kindness. Displaying this quality with my family has reflected on my whole life and has made my family life more loving and enjoyable. And so we're hoping people will practice the kindness and it will spill over, because uh, sometimes it's hard to be kind to your family. And so we have the family table time contest, and so they only have to have one meal together and discuss uh, kindness. One of the questions that I love on here is, is it easier or harder to be kind to your family members? <laughs> so, so just take notes, and it can be on any piece of paper. And we have it in English and Spanish and French translations. So, um, and then they win a family staycation. And so please pass the word, because the chances are high. Because this is one of the contests we've been evaluating. So, uh, but you win two nights and three days at the Wyndham and some uh, tickets to the local attraction for however many people are in the family. So if it's a family of 10, then we'll get you 10 tickets. And so hopefully they'll have fun just hanging out of the pools and uh, going to some of the local attractions. Um, so those are the way, and then also Just Serve. They used to have one service activity. I don't know how people found time on a Tuesday to go do a park at the YMCA playground or something, but so we encourage people to go to Just Serve, the app, and find things to do with their family. And on there it'll say like whether it's age appropriate for younger people or if you have to call ahead and whether it's okay for groups. And so then families can serve together and spend some time together. So, um, so we're super grateful. The events is on the website, so check us out. And um, we are just once again so grateful for the support we always receive from Orange County Public Schools and we hope to continue to see OCPS schools winning the mayor's trophy for the essay entrance. Thank you so much. Well, thank you again. And as us is grateful for you all doing this for our students and our families, and it's such an important initiative. So thank you so much. All right, we are now on agenda item 3.01, Dr. Jenkins. Thank you, Chairman. This is the final opportunity for any input and board decision regarding a targeted rezoning. 
We will hear from Dr. McGowan and staff. Good evening and waiting for the slideshow. Nope. Ordinance. What we just had. Let me move out of the way. Did you have your PowerPoint loaded on here? We had some. One minute. This will take longer than the presentation. <laughs> So let me say as they're loading that up, something I say every time we do a rezoning. Um, after uh, Dr. McGowan uh, goes through the presentation, uh, we will then entertain a motion and vote on this proposed targeted rezoning. Uh, to those who may be watching, there may not be a lot of questions from the board. I always like to point out that by the time it gets to this level, by the time it reaches the board table, we have already had a rural development workshop on the issue and have uh, spent some amount of time vetting the issue, hearing from the public, and entertaining their thoughts and suggestions and having a pretty lengthy discussion on our own. So um, are you ready, Dr. Yes, McGowan? Sir. All right, well, let me turn it over to you then. Thank you, and I apologize for the delay. Good evening. Uh, let me introduce Renata Parapche, who's with me this evening from student enrollment. This evening, we bring you a targeted rezoning for the watermark area in southwest Orange County. This rezoning complies with school board policy JC. On September 10th, we held our community meeting. September 27th, we had our rural development workshop. And this evening is the public hearing. We always provide very various ways for our public to, rot, to provide input. And we have three ways for that to occur. This year, Students that are involved in this rezoning are zoned for Independence Elementary School. For next year, they are currently zoned for the New Relief School 25E SW4. If we look at our map, the red line represents the elementary boundary for the 2019-20 school year. The two schools involved in this rezoning are 25E SW4 and 49 EW4. The area that we are proposing to rezone is south of Seidel Road. And again, this area is zoned currently for 25 ESW4. The recommendation is to move the targeted area in yellow from 25 ESW4 to 49 EW4. There are currently 28 student elementary school students in the yellow area. If this rezoning is approved, the purple area will be the zone for 25E SW4, and the green area will be 49EW4. We have not received any additional input for this rezoning since our rural development workshop on September 27th. Dr. Jenkins. Chairman. All right, putting on my best teacher hat tonight. So for those who may be watching, 25 ESW4 and 49 EW4 Four. Four are our uh, numeric designations for schools that have not opened yet or, or been Correct. named yet. and. Uh, uh, 29, I believe, refers to, or 49 refers to the school site. Uh, e refers to elementary. SW refers to the learning community. And 4 refers to the school board member district, which in this case is Ms. Gould. So um, Ms. Gould has done a wonderful job of shepherding through this targeted rezoning. And really, this is a follow-up to a commitment that we made to a group of parents and families in uh, and really, I want to thank you, Ms. Gould, for following through on that commitment to address their individual concerns about dividing their neighborhood, a division that was not done intentionally because a major road does separate it. But So let me turn it over to you to do the honors and make the motion and make any comments. Uh, yes, thank you. And thank you, Board, for going through the process more, more than once. And um, you have speakers on this? Okay. 
Well, why don't we let them, why don't we let the, go ahead and let the speakers come forward and then I can make my. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Gordon. Forgive me, I completely sk slipped my mind that we do have a speaker, Ms. Teresa Toscano. Ms. Toscano, welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. And if you could start with your address for the record, Ms. Toscano. Uh, my name is Teresa Toscano. I live at 9387 Trinana Circle in Winter Garden, Florida. And I mostly wanted to say I was in support for this. I also wanted to take the time to say thank you to the board, um, Ms. Gould and Dr. McGowan for all of your help. I also wanted to commend all of the communication efforts that this board and the school board puts forth. I was able to follow this process from March when I signed the agreement to purchase my house and understood what was going on from my home in Palm Beach County. So I was able to go, go to your website and go to talk to um, Dr. McGowan and email her and everybody answered my questions. Everybody was warm, very welcoming and took their patience to explain to us and make sure that we understood the process that we needed to go to to keep our community together. So mostly I just wanted to say thank you. Wow, we love that kind of public comment. <laughs> you sure don't get that. <laughs> and we don't get that a lot in rezoning, so that's even more special. <laughs> Ms. Gould. Wow, what more is there to say? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I also want to uh, echo those words and, and thank the staff for going through this. We looked at a lot of different ways because the growth over there and we're trying to manage it to the best of the ability with really minimizing splitting up neighborhoods and moving people numerous times. But when you're on the edge of the wave, it's just going to happen. And um, so we're trying to really mitigate that as much as possible. And thank you so much for working with the community on this. And I um, would like to present that as it was presented by our staff this evening in the superintendent's recommendation um, to move this targeted rezoning forward. Second. All right, it's been moved by Ms. Gould to approve uh, the targeted rezoning, seconded by Ms. Cadle. Is there any further debate or discussion of the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Show the motion adopted unanimously. Ms. Gordon. Yes, I really want to comment on the parent because um, I, I love hearing that when the board puts along with the superintendent staff making sure and they work so hard to put the process when i heard you say the process helped you to get in touch and i do want to make a statement because you know because i we had a meeting um last evening when we are building and rezoning communities and building schools it is very important to follow the process but when we alleviate from the process then the community gets all mixed up because somewhere along the line somebody's going to come up with their own ideas and then the main body which is the board and those that made the policy is going to see that it was violated but by following that process and coming before the board and we having the targeted uh, selection process go through uh, Dr. McGowan's office, it has really been very, very successful. So we're hoping that maybe that we keep in mind that even when we are building our schools, that we follow even the community process because eventually you all will be going through that too. So when you have the community, but when we begin to pull away, and I wanted to make this clear tonight, when we begin to pull away and go into our own little groups, then the process is broken because people begin to change things and then you don't get the best outcome. So if we stay with the process, stay with the operation procedure and stay with the policy that the board has put in place until it fails or does not meet the needs of the people then we need to bring that back but um, I, I thank you for making that comment that was a very powerful and strong comment for you to make as a parent because a lot of people are not really aware of what we really go through up here and they don't only just meet with us as a board each one of Dr. McGowan's staff, they have to meet with us two and three and four times because if we're not satisfied, we're gonna throw it back to them and they gotta go back 
and then come back before they can take it back to that designated, in this case, Ms. School, her board, and then they have to go back in the community and try to come back together until we all can agree. So I thought that the chairman explained it well, but I think you took the cake, and thank you so very much. Thank you, Ms. School. Ms. Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just. Um, wanted to make some brief comments because I think there is nothing that's more difficult that we have to deal with on a board than a, than a rezoning of student boundaries. I think all of us have gone through it. But I think, uh, as Ms. Gordon says, I appreciate the parents' comments because every situation is unique to a parent or, or a student who's, who's involved with a rezoning. And I want to commend Dr. McGowan and her staff for being attuned to that. I, I think um, it's a job that I would have just, I, I would have gotten fired if I was in her position. You know, I mean, I would just thrown the books up and just said, I can't take it, just go to school wherever you want. You know, but, um, and, I, and I can say this now because it's I've only got two more board job. meetings, you know. It's not easy. But, but, <laughs> but, but, that you know the the crew over there is just incredibly patient and incredibly open and they never get tired of hearing comments from the staff i mean it's remarkable it's remarkable and i just um, want want to commend uh, dr mcgowan and her group because really seriously i would i would have been out of there but um and to the parent it's good to have that feedback because you know it's like the woman who came and spoke to us last week that said you know, I'm a parent, and yeah, I don't have time. And we're all like, and then you start listening, listening and, and you hear everybody's situation, and you just have to keep those ears open and and listen. You know how you always hear, listening is the most important aspect of any task you do. So I just wanted to give those comments and, you know, thank the parent and, and thank you and Renata and your crew. You guys are remarkable. Thank you. Mr. Toscano, you probably thought we never got invited to prom before, did you? <laughs> Until tonight. <laughs> and Dr. McGowan, Renata, you know, I've always felt like your spouses deserve medals because they probably hear an earful from you when you get home at night, but you are the perfect people for this job. You really are. And uh, you all both have the patience of Job, everybody in your department. And I, I'll echo that. I'm always so impressed with um, how patient you are and understanding. And, and amen. Amen, Ms. Flynn. All right, so um, congratulations again. Um, so we are now board members on the consent agenda. Um, uh, are there any comments or questions on the consent agenda? If not, can I entertain a motion to adopt it? So moved. It's been moved by Ms. Cato, seconded by uh, Mrs. Gordon. Um, is there any debate or discussion of that motion? All those in favor of adopting the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Show the consent agenda adopted unanimously. Uh, we are now on um, report of the superintendent. Thank you, Chairman. Um, two things I wanted to address. First, a uh, reminder to everyone we are in that season of OCPS Gives campaign. Hope folks will consider uh, worthy entities you might contribute to, including our OCPS Foundation, United Way, and others. Secondly, I wanted to speak um, briefly regarding some social media activity around a teacher who resigned from one of our schools. I have a breakfast meeting coming up with Wendy Dormel so that we can discuss it. I've actually spoken to her on the phone as well since it generated some social media attention. I've also emailed another individual and invited them to come and discuss their concerns with me. While it would seem fair to hear both sides of the story, it really doesn't matter. It's not important. We don't want to lose a single good teacher from our district. That is what matters. I think we can also use the feedback uh, to help us improve organizationally around issues of concern. Um, what I like for getting that feedback are our randomly selected teacher roundtables because they do not focus on um, uh, 
any specific group of teachers, but a random sampling of nearly 15,000 teachers. So we will be increasing uh, those round tables, waiting on new board members before we start those up. Area superintendents have already started there. They are going to be addressing uh, and focusing on some of the concerns that were mentioned as well. Uh, and area superintendents have done round tables in the past. We will, we will continue, increase, and focus some of those areas. We think it's a more accurate way to get a general picture of how our teachers feel about certain topics when you take random samples among the 15,000. We're looking into issues around accountability and professional development. We have to remain focused on student success, uh, which is based on the current state system. A and that state system is high stakes. And so we have to remain focused on student success, but can't get to student success if you don't focus on teacher success as well. High performing districts, research is clear, focus on centralized uh, curriculum, centralized assessment, and centralized professional development. Large urban districts because they have mobility. Sounds, Sounds like my mic went out. Uh, because they have to focus on mobility and significant uh, student and family needs and so we've tried to focus there as well nonetheless we need to be sensitive in how we help both teachers and students succeed uh, I, I heard one comment that 20 years ago we did not um, require as much of teachers and I reminded them 20 years ago we had less than a 50 percent graduation rate and so you have to remember times have changed and the stakes are high both for our children and for our students. So we're gonna work on, uh, again, a balance between helping students and teachers succeed. I sent um, my quarterly email uh, video message to teachers this afternoon. I wanted to read it to you uh, briefly just so, and, and you have a copy as well. But here is the actual script. Uh, can you believe we've started our second grading period for this school year? I want to thank you for all that you do for the children we serve. Their success is the core of our business, and we recognize that you are the key to that success. Here are a few points I want to make. First, thank you for being a safe haven for our students. You're making a profound difference as you continue to give the message that they can come to you if they ever have a problem and that you will get them to the help they need. Second, let's continue to help students realize that passion and perseverance can make the difference for their success. Hard work can actually help students get smarter due to the nature of the brain. So that grit, passion, and perseverance is what we want them to have. Here's an interesting fact. Research strongly indicates that students perform at higher levels when a teacher gives simple feedback along the lines of, I have great expectations for you and I know you can accomplish them. You see, what the research actually showed was a handwritten note on a student essay that simply said, I know you can do better, resulted in much higher performance by students. As you've guessed by now, my quarterly message was going to be more than talking about a, a teacher's resignation. I wanted to give them additional information as well. Thirdly, nothing has significantly changed in our current state accountability system and pay for performance requirements. Students can be retained or fail to graduate based on standardized test results. Schools are still labeled with a single letter grade regardless of our advocacy to end that system and teachers and principals still have their employment and pay raises based upon student outcomes. It's important to stress teachers and principals. Until such time that we're able to impact those laws, we remain committed to helping you succeed and keeping Orange County as the place for teachers to work in Florida. Last year, 99.6% of our teachers received highly effective or effective evaluation ratings, making them eligible to receive state-mandated performance pay raises. Let me assure you that we are always striving to meet your needs. Improved teacher retention rates might indicate that we are moving in the right direction. Number four, I want to thank you for working collaboratively in your professional learning communities at school. Remember last year we decreased PLCs from three required to just one per week, except for schools with great student needs. Essentially, that is one out of up to 10 planning times. 
When teachers come together to problem solve and develop lessons, the outcomes for students are positive. PLCs also help prevent a sense of isolation for many teachers and help spread best practices. Just as you help students enjoy coming to school every day, we have challenged principals to help teachers enjoy coming to work through collaboration and much more. The job can be tough, but the rewards are significant. Lastly, as the holiday season approaches, remember the school board agreed to provide every employee with a bonus in January. Stay tuned for news as that bonus may actually be increased. We've been fortunate to work with dedicated school board members. As several prepare to leave us next month, I must tell you they have always had a heart for our students and supported teachers. Thank you again for all you do for our 213,000 students every day in every classroom. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. Um, I think the message is excellent. I, I, I really do. But I do think also just in one school board member's perspective, I, I think maybe going forward, the less focus put on this issue, the better. Because I think that we're, uh, and I don't think I'm naive about this, I think we're hitting on all cylinders right now within the constraints of what we're required to do by state law and what we're required to do by federal law. And well, I realize the platform that it was published in is a high-profile platform. I don't want to give it any more attention than I think perhaps it than, than it warrants. So, just my perspective. I hadn't said that to you before, but I didn't know that that was in your message. I, and I do think the message is excellent, but um, I, I just don't want to perpetuate one teacher out of 13,000, 14,000 teachers' perspective. Um, Mr. Rodriguez, any um, general counsel's report? No report, Mr. Chair, and just an executive session after this. Okay. Um, all right. We have one uh, committee report, Community Action Board. Ms. Gould? Yes, the Community Action uh, Board is gearing up for, obviously, the holiday season and also for a lot of neighborhood improvements. So I would direct people to the attachment that will be on board docs with the minutes of all the various programs, everything from Head Start to weatherizing to utility relief and job um, support. And it's a lot of great information, and it's a wonderful resource that has some funding if people need help. Thank you for uh, representing us on the CAB. Really appreciate it. Filled some big shoes, big shoes, big shoes. All right, we are on, <laughs> we're on general uh, discussion items. Um, Ms. Flynn. Thank you. I'm doing my farewell school tour. I have two more to go, but um, it's, I know, but it's been great. I, you know, I have to say, we, didn't we have just principals week or month recently? And, and in speaking with our principals, boy, they work hard. They work really hard. And I know we know this is not a surprise, but I, I feel that they're overlooked sometimes a little bit in the general discussion of education. But our uh, there's one principal in District 2 that went from the AP to the principal. And I asked, I said, well, do you see it's different? Her eyes got wide. And she goes, oh, yes, it is. It's very different. So an enormous amount of enormous amount of responsibility put on our principals and I just wanted to say and, and I think everyone will echo that I appreciate what they do I think it's got to be the hardest one of the hardest jobs in education um, the other thing I noticed in in speaking with um, it was Colonial High School they have been uh, the, the the principal there and their band director have been very innovative in using some of their Title I funds to ba pay for band fees for their students. So it cuts out that obstacle to students not being able to afford band. But they notice that the influx of kids coming in from middle schools is not as great as it used to be. So then I was speaking with the principals over in the middle school, and one of them said, "Well." many of our eighth graders are having to choose between high school electives now that they want to take or some of these other and they're foregoing music now it was that just an isolated event but i, I and that's a feeder pattern so I, I just wanted to put that out there because 
you know, it's, it's what the unintended consequence of something that you feel is, is, is really working well. I don't want to keep the kids from taking high school classes, but that may be one of the areas that's uh, the music and the, the band that's getting a little bit shortchanged by it. That, that was just, and again, it might be isolated, but in talking, that's something that stuck out to me. The other thing is today we approved a land purchase. It's actually within District 3, but it will relieve, the school eventually will relieve some of the schools in District 2. But that land purchase for 16.2 acres is $7.8 million just for the property. Just for the property. It's cheap. Come west. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you can say it's cheap, but it, this is not this is outrageous. not in the area. It's, it's not outrageous. in. It's it's outrageous. I, I mean, the that's the deal is closed. But I I just want to say when it's people outrageous. say we don't plan ahead, yeah, it's that we don't, it's outrageous that that's not just the cost of the building. Then we have to add that on there. So I, I wanted to put that out that, you know, that is a challenge that we have when we're building our new schools. It's a huge land I just feel like I need to talk about something else. You no, that's it. <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's all I have. Thank you. I uh, miss Gould. Um, yeah, I, I made joke of that, but it, in the last since I came on the board, the um, the land costs uh, have just been incredible, and the closer that you get to that disney and sure. area the prices are outrageous so it, it gets to be mind-boggling just the land costs and trying to communicate that to people on why we can't move schools up faster um which you know i'm highly in favor of but it, it is challenging but that's not what i want to talk about tonight she just got me on a roll on that um uh i I um, wanted to share with my fellow board members, I think some of you know, but I couldn't remember if I had already announced this, so if I have, I'm sorry. I'm repeating it because we're two weeks out. We're doing a program with Donna Orender, and Donna Orender was a WNBA player who moved up into um, upper management with the WNBA, became an anchor. She worked for the... Um, the, the PGA, and then she started her own business. And her business is really targeted at um, helping women. She does a lot of things, uh, but she's a very entrepreneur spirit and, and a wonderful entrepreneur, TED Talk speaker, et cetera. But she started this program for women to create um, a, a networking event with uh, a really strong purpose that exposes women to lots of different industries and cross sectors. Well, she adapted this about four years ago, five years ago, for high school students in Jacksonville. And we are partnering with her to bring that here on Wednesday, November 7th from 2 to 6. We've partnered also with Plaza Live, so we will have 400 high school girls um, in the audience, and we're recruiting 200 mentors. I need 40 more mentors for this program. So we need 40 more mentors. Um, addition, if there are already additions volunteers, it would make it a little bit easier. But if you get onto the OCPS website and right on the front page, ocps.net, there is a GenWow button and click on that. Um, it'll take you through the uh, application process and we will do our best to get that screening done. But if you already are screened and able to work in our school programs, please step up and join us. Um, it's going to be a phenomenal edutainment day. It'll inspire the mentors as much as it will our young women and really open up the eyes of our students to all of the various career opportunities, no matter what sector you're talking about. When we talk about STEM, they often think you have to be a doctor or a computer scientist, and there are so many different jobs um, out there. And we will have wonderful women from everything from entertainment to, to healthcare uh, kind of sharing their story in a very, very fun, interactive way. So uh, please help us get those last few mentors for these lovely young ladies. And w it's not a huge time commitment. The, um, the program, you'd sit with them through the program. There will be a walk that uh, there'll be instructions for. And then we ask if you can try to reach out 
um, twice in a year. And if something else fosters, we welcome that, but it's not a heavy duty um, lift on this one. But we need the, the, the women in the room that day to be there and present. So November 7th, two to six, and we have dinner sponsored. We, we're giving away t-shirts. What else could I use to entice people? I need those last 40 out of the 200. <laughs> Free water. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. All right, Ms. Cato. I'm gonna put a challenge out to my retiring board members who are females, that I signed up. I was not an additions volunteer. I was very happy to find out I've been approved as an additions volunteer. But um, it would be a way, I know we all enjoy seeing what the kids are up to when we visit the schools. So this is a way that we can pull away, but we can still have an impact in the lives of young women. So I'm putting the challenge out to actually all the female um, board members, please get involved. All right. Yes, Miss Flynn. <laughs> it's just, oh God, I just one more, just one. Today we did the dedication for Hidden Oaks. So Hidden Oaks was a modular school, just, you know, just really one of those that was horrible. And a comment that was made by a teacher who had been there from the very beginning or there for 20 years. She just made a comment like, yeah, we just sort of gave up trying to get moved up. And you know, there was that feeling, it seemed that they had been forgotten. And when you think about that the one, mint, one cent, half cent came about in 2002, I believe. 16 years ago. 16 years ago. And that the weighted criteria for getting up on that list was Capacity, really, was over capacity. That was the best one. And then we had the unitary settlement that moved some of those. I, I tried to say all that, but I felt, I felt really bad because, you know, they, 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 they have. And I, there's still two other schools in District 2 that are old that are getting um, renovated. So I guess with this, I'm just trying to say that they weren't forgotten. I, I did try to say that to as many people, but there's still that feeling. I don't know what we could do, but through this, I'm just saying, you're not forgotten. It was just the way that it, it's hard to remember that from 16 years ago, why the schools were placed on that list. Mm -hmm. I promise that's it right now. Ms. Cato. Well, and the same thing happened to me with Union Park Elementary last week. And it was one of my comments was, because I was called out there three years ago and they were complaining about the water fountains and the bathrooms. And they had very valid, legitimate complaints. And I told them, just be patient. Please be patient. And it's hard to be patient when you've waited for 12 years. But... At least at Union Park Elementary, the excitement of the new building, the bands that they have, if you have not, if you have not seen the video of it, they had a jazz band of fifth graders. They had the front porch band that were second graders who sang Old MacDonald and did everything from having a little washboard that they were playing with spoons, who happened to be the principal's son, oh. to um, a keyboard, someone who played the keyboard, someone who played the drums. There are great, great things happening in our schools. And I left Union Park Elementary going, I am so proud this happened. And they are so grateful. Everyone was so grateful. And they were, they just praised how great the building was. And, you know, I'm sure Hidden Oaks was very similar to Union Park Elementary. They were building the new school while the old school was over here and watching that. And we dedicated, dedicated it, but their playgrounds aren't done yet but they will be done shortly. So um, to all of those, like what Mrs. Flynn said, the old areas of this county ended up being low on the list, and they have been very, very patient. 
but I think I speak for all of us that represent those. We have also been steadfast that you're not moving our schools down. If we're 101, you leave us at 101. If we're 110, you leave us at 110. We're not going to be 111. We're not going to be 112. And I'm proud that we have stayed the course with saying, uh-uh, you can't do that to that community. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, we will see everybody upstairs in executive session. With that, we are adjourned.